Good morning, Life Bridge. Good morning. good morning, man. Good to see you this morning. Uh, we're in this series called To Infinity and Beyond. And man, the past two weeks, Pastor Luke has just poured his heart out. And boy, it's been amazing, has it not? And I think the Lord is cultivating in us something very, very special. And that is he's preparing to do a work in and through each of us and collectively as his church. And we've been talking about and thinking about, well, what does that mean as far as our finances go? And, and, and what does it mean to be a generous giver? What does it mean to be a cheerful giver? What do all these things mean? So we're just kind of hopping into his word and discovering that his word is truth. And so this morning, as we prepare to hop in God's word, you guys ready for this? You ready to hop into his word? Because his word will change us, will transform us. And I believe God wants to say something and do something through us today. You agree with that? Hey, well, let's pray together. Will you join me? Lord Jesus, we come into this place today to submit ourselves. Father, we come in here today to seek you, to hear from you. Father, we come to give you worship. And Lord, I pray that as we do, Lord, that you will meet us in this place. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will move among these seats. God, I pray that you will speak very clearly through your word for your glory, Jesus, for your glory and your glory alone. And I pray, God, that the ultimate result will be that we will see your hands. We will, we will see you do miraculous things in and through our lives for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, amen. Well, we are in John chapter six today, and it is the feeding of the 5,000. Most of you are familiar with the story. And the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle outside the resurrection of Jesus Christ that's found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's found in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John. And so today we're going to be looking in John, but we're also going to be kind of allowing Matthew, Mark, and Luke to, to give us more of a rounded view of the picture of what was happening. And so I want to give you some background as we start thinking and looking and kind of stepping into the story. So we see that John begins by saying, and then Jesus went. And after this, Jesus went. And so what is the after this? Well, Jesus had been, had been healing, he had been ministering, he had been teaching, he had been pouring himself out. And so he looks at his disciples and says, hey, let's get away. Let's take a little bit of a vacation. Let's just have some rest. And so the disciples and Jesus go across the Sea of Galilee to a place on the other side, whereas Bethsaida is the name of the city or the town, Bethsaida. And then they go from there up into the hills, up into a remote place, remote, removed area. Well, as they're doing this, because Jesus' ministry is growing, people are seeing him, they're hearing, word is getting out, and so the people begin to follow. People begin to follow. And so as Jesus and the disciples go to this remote place, people begin to arrive following Jesus by the thousands, by the thousands and thousands. And so we see that in Mark 6, we see that Jesus walks out and he sees the multitude of people and Mark says that he has compassion on them because they are sheep without a shepherd. He has this compassion and because of the compassion of Jesus, it later births a miracle. So I want to start off this morning by laying the foundation of the story. And the foundation begins with this truth. The compassion of God is the making of a miracle. Without the love and the compassion of God, there would never have been a miracle. It is what moves God's heart for me and for you and for those that he saw that day. Now, I want you to understand how many people there were there. We, we know that Jesus fed the 5,000, but it was 5,000 men. 
The reality is that when you have women and children added to that number, biblical historians believe it's probably between 15,000 and 20,000 people that showed up in this remote area. And it's interesting, as Jesus is looking out and he is moved with compassion, guess what the disciples are doing? Again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tells us that they are seeing this massive crowd who've been invited to their vacation and they are concerned, so they come to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, we're in a remote place and it's getting late and we're concerned that they don't have any food or shelter. So their response as practical men is, hey, why don't you send them away? Send them away so that they can find food on their own and so they can find shelter. They're practical men. We can't care for these people. There's way too many people. I mean, what are we gonna do with these people? We certainly can't feed them. But Jesus' response is telltale. They say, send them away, and Jesus says, no, they need to be here. Instead, you feed them. You feed them. It's interesting when we begin to look in this text, we begin to see the picture is Jesus not only didn't send them away, he gave the disciples the responsibility of feeding them. Now think about this. Just think about it for just a second. When the disciples, practical guys, when they loaded up to go across the Sea of Galilee to go to a remote place for a short time of vacation, if you will, to to begin to spend some time away to retool. You know, they probably took their own rations, don't you think? These are practical guys. They had their own cliff bars, right? They had their fanny packs, they were full. I mean, they were going, they knew they were going to a remote place. So it's interesting to me that Jesus would look at them and say, you feed them. Well, they had rations, they had rations. I wonder why they chose not to dip into their rations because they're practical guys and they're like, hey, this is for us. We gotta have our own thing here and there's no way we can feed all these people. It's impossible. And I want you to see something very important here. Jesus was moved with compassion and the disciples were just simply concerned. Jesus was moved with compassion that would birth a miracle The disciples were concerned, and because it didn't necessarily move them to action, there's a close cousin to concern, and that's indifference. They were concerned, but they weren't willing to feel the sting of providing, so the concern really was indifference. See, Jesus had empathy. Jesus had mercy, he had tenderness, he had sympathy, and a compulsion to care for them. And so we start off with a test. John tells us he was testing them, and he begins with a test. Jesus turns to Philip, and why did he turn to Philip? Because Philip is from Bethsaida. This is his neck of the woods. So Jesus looks at Philip and he says, says this, look, with, look at uh, verse five with me. John 6, verse five, this is what it says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where do we go to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do and Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for them to get a little. Here Philip has done some quick math. He's looked out there and he's tried to count these people and he's thought, you know, eight months, eight months worth of wages, about $8,000 might give them a tiny snack. It may barely feed these people. It would be a very, very small, if indeed we can even provide. So here Philip is already in the test settling for less. He's settling for less. Let me give you a truth here. We often offer the barely sufficient when God wants to do massively more. 
You and I offer the barely sufficient when God wants to do massively more. Here Philip is saying, hey, hey, I'm, I'm thinking that we could do this, but it won't be enough. So I'm just gonna barely settle for less here. And God is saying, no, 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 no. That's not what I wanna do. See, we, this, this, this is us. We offer what we can afford. We offer what we think we can afford. We embrace the finite and go down. God wants to go infinite and beyond. We look at ourselves, our human abilities, our talents, our bank account, our 401k. We look at what we can afford. Well, let's see, if we reach here, I might be able to afford to do this, and so that'll barely make it over. We don't even think, well, the God of miracles is standing right amongst you. It's what we do, guys. It's what we do. So God wants to do so much more, and God multiplies what we bring him. God multiplies it. Compounded interest. It's a lot better than the stock market, people. I'm telling you, that's what Jesus does. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, there's, a, there's an incredible verse, and in context, When Jesus says this, he's speaking about actually forgiveness. But this is a principle that's applied over and over and over again, even to what we give, even to our offerings, even to what we bring. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap for with, this is it, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus is testing his disciples. He's testing me and you here today. It's the same thing. The disciples saw only questions. Jesus had only answers. The disciples saw massive, huge crowds. Jesus saw wandering sheep. The disciples feared the problem when Jesus was the only answer. Jesus was the only answer because he's a God of miracles. And yet in it all, they didn't offer their own rations. I mean, they had hung out with Jesus. They had seen him performing miracles. Did it not dawn on them that they could look to him even offering their rations and that God could even multiply that and feed all of these people? Didn't even dawn on them. Same thing with us. It doesn't dawn on us that God is walking with us. It doesn't dawn on us that God has given us an opportunity to walk with them and see the miraculous in our day. We're no different. We're no different. So in the midst of all of this, in the midst of it all, a child comes forth. Now we see in John that Andrew, Andrew is out looking. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Can you imagine what the disciples are doing? He told us to feed them? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? We gotta find some food. Not our food, but we gotta find some food. We gotta do something. We could go buy. See, they're going at it, and here this little child is watching them. And I can tell you the the little boy offered his Happy Meal to Andrew because Andrew wasn't gonna steal it from him. He's not gonna steal something from this little boy to take it to Jesus, absolutely not. So this little boy is listening and we know that he at some point says, here is what I have. It's all I have, but here is what I have if the master needs it. And the faith of a child compels the heart of God. And it births a miracle. It births a miracle. The disciples couldn't get there and it took a child. It took a child. And I want you to know that God didn't need this child's happy meal. He didn't need his five loaves and two fishes. I said fishes, fish. I know, I did that the first service. They said, Jeff, did you know you said fishes? Fish, so all you students out there. He didn't need it. God didn't need it. He could have called manna down from heaven. In the Old Testament, we see God provided manna in the desert. They could have had manna burgers. He could have miraculously caused food to just appear if he chose because he's God. But instead, he waited on an offering. He waited on an offering. Because that's how God rolls. Miracles are often preceded, preceded by a step of faith. 
Here, a sacrifice offering became the exact ingredient that moved the hand of God. And it took a little child. It took a child, a trusting child. So let me give you this truth this morning because this is what God is doing in us, what he desires to do in us. Miracles are born from childlike faith and genuine sacrifice. Miracles are born from childlike faith and genuine sacrifice. We see this over and over and over again. And one of the most beautiful places we see it is in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, once again, the disciples have lost their way. In Matthew 18, we see the disciples and they are arguing on who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom. Well, it's gonna be me. It's gonna be me. You know, I, I carry his stuff. Well, no, no, it's gonna be me because, you know, I wrote that little thing. Oh, it's gonna be me because I, they're arguing. Who's gonna be the greatest in the kingdom? So look at Matthew 18, starting in verse one. This, is, this will capture this because it's beautiful. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You, can you imagine Jesus just shaking his head and calling a child to him? He put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Think of it this way. When Jesus asked his disciples to feed the people, they didn't even think of their food. It took a child to offer his. When the disciples saw a massive, insurmountable problem, it took a child to see a solution. When the disciples measured a response in dollars, it took a child in poverty willing to give it all. When the disciples offered loaves and fishes as completely insufficient, because that's exactly what Andrew did. If you go back, you see see what John says. Andrew came and said, hey, we've got this, but it's not gonna be sufficient. We had five barley loaves and two fish, and I want you to understand that those barley loaves were very small, and they were made with barley. Barley is typically what you would feed an animal. The fish, the actual Greek word here in the fish is not a big fish, it's a little fish, almost like a salted sardine. This little boy had barley loaves and two little tiny fish, and he offered it. He was poor. He gave his gift out of poverty. And it's all it took to bring a miracle. Don't miss what Jesus is saying. He's saying that we must be like children to enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Not childish, childlike. He's looking for childlike faith in you and I to be like the little boy who says, I may not have much, it's what I have, but I offer it all to you. I give you my best. I give you my best. Can I give you a definition, just a Jeff definition of childlikeness? It's this, is to blindly trust the goodness, care, leadership, and provision of a father. It means setting aside our will. Children blindly trust, don't they? Until they learn not to because of us. Children blindly trust. They're not concerned about tomorrow. They're not concerned how much food's in the pantry. They're not concerned how much money's in the bank account. They don't have a conscience that wakes them up at night. They sleep good. They're not worried about tomorrow. That is what it means to be childlike. And see, God takes the five loaves and two fishes and bl- fish and blessing it, multiplies it, and feeds between 50 and 20,000 people with a tiny little Happy Meal, but not a snack. He didn't just give them a snack. They were fully satisfied, John says, fully satisfied. They ate and they ate and they ate and they ate. Ate, roll over on your side, rub your stomach, kinda eat. Pull out the toothpick at the end and start doing this type of eat. You've seen people coming out of restaurants after they've like really eaten, pulling out the toothpick type thing. That's what it was. It was Thanksgiving kind of eating. Everybody, everybody fully satisfied, including the little boy. When he gave his meal to Jesus, guess what he got back? A whole lot more than he gave. And guess what else? 
there were 12 baskets of leftovers. You know, I can just imagine, because Jesus told the disciples, don't let anything go to waste. There's a lot to be said there too, wish we had time. But there are 12 baskets left over and, and I could just see Jesus looking at this little boy and said, come here. See those 12 baskets? You go back and not only feed your family, you feed the whole town. Feed the whole town. 12 baskets left over because that's what God does when we come to him with childlike faith. That's what he does. God exponentially multiplies our offering to advance his kingdom. That's what he does. You know, we talked about last week, Luke talked about last week, David. Talked about David when he came to purchase the threshing floor. The threshing floor would become the temple mount. You know, one of the things that David understood is that it all belongs to God. He understood it all belongs to God. Listen to David, Psalm 24. Listen to what he says. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. When Jesus takes the loaf and fish, when Jesus receives the loaves and fish, he's receiving something that's already his. It's already his. Jesus is creator God. Who do you think made the seed? that was placed in the dirt that created the barley, Jesus. He owns it all. Who do you think created the fish that were put in the sea that now returns to him? Jesus did. When he received that gift, he received something that was already his. You know, David understood that. David understood that he owns it all. When he went to buy the threshing floor, remember last week, Luke was teaching on this. He said, I'm gonna purchase this because I will not offer God something that doesn't cost me anything. It's gonna be an act of worship. And we see with David later, later in his life, he deeply desired to be able to build the temple but God wasn't gonna allow him. It was gonna be Solomon who would build it. So what David desired deepest towards the end of his life is to give an offering, to give an offering to build. It was his dying wish to build the house of God. And though he wouldn't be able to build it, he would give towards it. And David modeled, listen to me, he, David, David modeled such generosity that other people in Israel would follow suit. He gave an enormous gift to the construction of the temple. In fact, David's gift was so big, it caused a celebration of worship, a huge celebration to break out in Chronicles 29. And you know, a lot of biblical historians believe that the, listen to this, the net, the the amount of money that he gave, the amount of money in today's terms, listen to this, was anywhere between 200 and 400 billion. That's what he gave. But he did it with an open hand. We, we don't know of David's net worth. No, that's not what we know about him. What we know about him is he's a man after God's own heart because it was about his heart, it was about his spirit, and he gave back to the Lord joyfully. Now, when you think about, you know, what what kept a man with that kind of wealth to, what kept him from becoming corrupt? What kept him from becoming uh, power hungry and selfish? It was his heart towards God. It was his heart. In the end, that is what God is looking for. It's our heart. He's wanting to transform us and do something in us. But here's what we wrestle with. We think because we go and we earn and we have that it's ours. Have you ever seen a U-Haul hitched to a hearse? No, because it's not yours and you're not taking it with you. David understood that. And guess what? He lived that way. He lived that way. He invested himself in the legacy to come and God took it and multiplied it. That's what God does. Let me give you this truth, because this is important for all of us. It's important for me. Surrendering ownership 
prompts a heart of gratitude and becomes generosity. Let me say it again, surrendering ownership prompts a heart of gratitude that becomes generosity. And let me tell you this, the opposite is true. Listen to me, don't miss this. The opposite is true, a firm hold on ownership leads to fear, anxiety, and spiritual bankruptcy. There are people who spend their lives afraid of losing what they have. And God's like, if you just give it to me, you never have to worry about it. If you just trust me with the heart of a child, you'll never have to worry about it. And I will multiply it and I will do the miraculous in and through you and in and through the church. Those are the people that God is looking for. So what does it mean to go to infinity and beyond? What does it mean for us? How do we get there? The Bible instructs us, it teaches us. The question is, do we wanna walk in obedience? Do we wanna do what the Bible says? That's the question in here today. I mean, the last two weeks, man, I'm telling you, sitting right over here, we got to the end of the service, I was about to jump over the, over the chairs. I'm like, man, yes, Lord, you are worthy of it all. Yes, Lord. But it's not there to inspire you. It's not there for you to be concerned. It's there for you to experience the compassion and the love of God because he wants to use LifeBridge Church to do to the infinity and beyond. Anybody wanna be a part of infinity and beyond or would you rather finite and below? Which is it? Infinity and beyond, yeah? yeah. That's what I wanna be a part of. I wanna be a part of it. Guys, we don't have much time. We ain't got much time. We have now. What do you wanna be a part of? Well, if you wanna be a part of it, then it's time for action. It's time for us to do this. James says, faith without works is dead. Don't be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. Listen, you have an opportunity to get in the game, to get in God's game for his glory, not your glory, not my glory, not life for his glory, for God's glory and his glory alone. So let me, let me give you three practical steps this morning, Very, just three practical steps, okay? The scripture teaches from the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament, and it actually even adjusts some when the New Testament church is born. But it's the, it's the, the meaning and, and the truth of a tithe. It's the precept of a tithe. Have you ever heard of a tithe before? Okay, let me tell you what that is. Step number one, a tithe is a step of obedience, ownership versus stewardship. You know, last week God said, God doesn't need your numbers, he needs your obedience. So in the Bible, Tithe is taught. I, I grew up, when I, was, when I was a kid, my dad, every week, I, my dad taught me to tithe. He, he taught me because he modeled it for me. And back then, you took an envelope, he would write a check, put it in there. Every week, we took it. We placed it in the offering. Placed it in the offering. And I learned it. And I practiced it. And then I learned, man, you can't outgive God. This is really cool. My first job. It's amazing. Let me read to you Malachi 3.10. Many of you have heard this, but we need to understand what God is commanding us. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. And he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing until there is no more Need. See, this is the great thing about it. Bring a tithe, and guess what? Test me. Just test me. Just test me. Trust me. You don't care for yourself. I care for you. I care for you. I'm gonna care for you. Test me and see if I won't provide for your need. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Let me give you step number two. Cheerfully. Cheerfully from a place of genuine joy, investing in the eternal. One time I was in the Bahamas and uh, serving a church in Bahamas, visiting with them, great church, it was awesome. About halfway through the message, the pastor steps up and he goes, all right church, it's offering time. And you know what happened? A celebration. People were on their feet. 
They were yelling, they were clapping, and they were whistling, they were going crazy. And there I sat, scared to death. You know, I was like, what in the world is going on with these people? I'd never seen that before. And I started to realize, that these, these weren't people of great wealth, they weren't great wealth, but they were so excited to give back to God because they had experienced his faithfulness time and time and time again. And it was an act of worship, and they couldn't wait. And I'm gonna tell you something, some of the testimonies that came out of that church were miraculous, miraculous, because that's what God does. We do it cheerfully, not by compulsion, not because we just have to. We do it cheerfully. And let me say this to you. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. Don't judge each day by the harvest, by what you're gonna get out of it, but by the seeds you plant. That's how you judge each day. Paul says this, keep your life free from the love of money and be content, contentment, contentment. That's a whole nother message with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the final part is receive. Step three, receive. Receive from the Father. You cannot outgive God. Anybody know that, by the way? Did you know you can't outgive God? Some of you in this room have experienced it, haven't you? I see you nodding your head. You're going, yeah. I can tell you in my life, there are times when I was afraid to give. But I was prompted sometimes by the obedience of others around me as prompted to give. And I'm telling you, God met us in that point of giving and developed generosity. God is calling us into that. And then we receive. We receive. We receive his spirit. We receive his guidance. We receive his outpouring. And don't forget, he says, test me. Test me and see if I'll approve. There's something I wanna share with you guys. And, and you know, we... We as pastors and elders, we pray for you. We pray for our church. We pray for what God wants to do in and through LifeBridge Church because we do believe it's to infinity and beyond. We don't wanna bring just the sufficient or barely sufficient. We wanna trust him for the massively more. And you know, within 10 miles, let's say there's about 150,000 people around 10 miles from right here, okay? And let's say today we have 1,500 people here. That's 1%. How does the 1% reach the 99? How in the world do you do that? Look at me. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. You and I can't do it. Good. The impossible is God's speciality. It's his speciality. So I wanna share with you, I wanna share some vision this morning. Can I do that with you? Can, can I share with you what we see as infinity, what we believe God's put on our heart for infinity? Can, can I see if maybe this burns and resonates in any of you like it does in us? Because the journey is before us and I'm telling you, we believe that God has given us the land and we're ready to go, but we gotta do it together. Here's what we've prayed for. Just a few things. We wanna be a church where everyone is seen and cared for, for the single mom who got to the end of the month and can't make ends meet, who just got to notice her power will be cut off and rent is overdue, that we could step in and provide so that she will have power and a roof over her head and baskets left over. A church that reaches into the middle and high schools through ministries like FCA. We buy pizzas so that we can have a chance to talk about Jesus and gospel conversations. And then we invite troubled kids into a safe and loving place and have baskets left over. A church that can build the most unbelievable special needs safe space. So families who have young children and special needs can have a place to belong and have baskets left over. A church so generous that we can tithe, we can give and help plant other churches and reach other communities and have baskets left over. A church who, as God leads, we go international and we build an orphanage and we build a food bank and we clothe the poor and we give food to the hungry and we have baskets left over. 
A church that can provide biblical counseling to the broken marriages and families, to those recovering from abuse and neglect, and those who are struggling to overcome addictions and to have baskets left over. A church that can go in the field. This field, some of you parked in the field this morning, right? Last week we had 55 cars in the field because we didn't have sufficient parking out here. We're gonna go in the field and we're gonna make a place for everybody and have baskets left over. A church that can reach the next generation with the gospel and see a ministry like Key, like Key, draw the next generation and change the trajectory of our culture to reach that next generation and have baskets left over. A church that's not empty during the week, but we invest in people's lives. We build a coffee shop so people can have biblical conversations over coffee and have baskets left over. A church that hosts communal groups, events on our property, in buildings that we have yet to build and have baskets left over. A church that's reaching the community so well The world takes notice, and we have baskets left over. That's just a little bit. Now, so what does that mean for us? The compassion of God or the concern of the disciples? The compassion of God or the concern of the disciples? Listen to me, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. So where are you this morning? Where are you this morning? Look, how are we gonna reach 150,000 people? That's just a few people. How are we gonna do everything that I just mentioned? It's impossible, we can't do it. We can't do it, we can't do it. Good, God, you're gonna have to do it. And he does it all through the Bible and he's doing it now for those who will be like the child who will come and say, I ain't got much. (laughs) I just got me a cliff bar here. It's my best. Master, take it and use it. And we do that, we, we start having steps like faith, uh, steps like that of faith in this church, and God will do the infinite and beyond. It will happen because he's done it all through the word. He's done it all through his Bible. Hey, Moses, hey, Moses, what's that in your hand? What's that in your hand? It's, it's, a, it's a staff, it's a shepherd's staff. Throw it down, Moses. Throw it down, Moses. Moses throws it down, it becomes a snake. God says, hey, Moses, pick up the snake. Oh, God, I don't do snakes. And you're not gonna pick it up by the tail. Pick up the snake, Moses. Moses picks it up, and it becomes the rod of God by which he will deliver the Israelites from bondage. Hey, David, what's that in your hand? David, what is that in your hand? Well, I have five stones here. Oh, I just need one, just one smooth stone. And I will down a giant in the Philistine army. And I will make you a great king through whom the next true king will come. Hey, Peter, 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 what is that in your hand? It's a net, Lord, it's a net. I'm a fisherman. This is how I provide for my family. Let go the net, Peter. Let go the net. Well, Lord, I let go the net, Peter, because if you do, And follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Hey, Thomas, what's that you got in your hand, Thomas? I don't have anything to give except my doubts. Bring your doubts to me, Thomas. Come, touch the wounds, touch my side, and then fall in worship. And rise a great, courageous man to whom I will fill my spirit and will use mightily. Hey, Paul, what is that in your hand, Paul? Well, I'm a learned man. I'm a learned man, and I write, and I dictate. Is that a pen in your hand? That's a pen in my hand. Hey, Paul, put that pen in my hand, because through the power of my spirit, I will write the letters to the church that in 2022, they are still going to be reading. And I will change the trajectory of Christianity. Guys, Life Ridge Church, What's in your hand? What is in your hand? What is in your hand? If you offer it to him like that child, if you would just take that step of faith, we will never look back. 
We will see God do something that we could never imagine. You wanna be a part of a move of God? How many of you wanna be a part of a move of God? You wanna be a part of a move of God? Okay, it's time to get skin in the game. It's time to get skin in the game. Let's do this. When I was a kid, one of the ways that we would respond in moments like this is God prompts us. As we had those envelopes, those little things we'd fill out. And now we don't do that anymore, everything's electronic. Don't allow the electronic to just become transactional for you, please. Allow it to be worship for you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you. Today, today in this week, why don't you see, why don't you pray, why don't you see what your five loaves and fishes are? Fish. Why don't you see what that is? And offer it back to him. Because guess what? It's already his. <laughs> it's already his. Now I want you to see the screen's gonna come up. Just transactional part of it. Boy, I wish I could call you all down right here. And this, this is the way we, right here. It's one of the ways you do it. But Jeff, I've never taught before. Well, there you go. Jeff, I wanna bring an offering to, there you go. To fuel the vision that I just mentioned to you. That's what it does. To see God move in ways that we could never imagine. Oh God, how we long to see you move. And then here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to do this. Will you share your story? When you test God, when you step out there and you test him, you might not have a job right now and you're like, Jeff, I don't know how I'm gonna do it yet. I get it, I get it. That little boy, when he offered it, he's like, I don't know what I'm gonna eat, but I trust Jesus. Test God. And then share your story. Share your story. Share the goodness of God. Encourage others. Talk about it in your families. Talk about it with your kids. Talk about it with your friends. Share your story. And we will see God do something that we could never imagine. Now, does that light you on fire? Look at me. Does that light you on fire? Yeah. 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 To see God do it. Will you stand with me? Just stand up with me. You know, we love you guys. We really do. And we seek to teach his word unashamedly so that you can walk in truth. That's what we seek to do at LifeBridge Church. It's impossible, but God is the God of the impossible. He's a miraculous God, amen? Hey, I'm gonna pray, we're gonna, we're gonna worship. Now, I'm gonna encourage you. Here's the thing. You don't necessarily have to leave early. The restaurants are still open. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Some of you go, well, I guess we're not going now. <laughs> I invite you, worship. Worship what these guys are gonna lead you in. Come on, make it your song. And then make it actionable. Do something. Do something. Lord Jesus, we come to you in this place. God, move among these aisles. Move among the hearts of your children. Lord, these are your sheep. This is your church. These are your people. We are. God, move, 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 Lord. We ask. We ask and long for the miraculous. So God, right now, we're gonna worship you. We're gonna sing what we're then gonna do. And I pray, Lord, that at the end of the day, when we, this week, when we start looking at what you're gonna do, we're gonna say, let's start moving on some of that vision that God's given us. Let's go to the infinity and God take us beyond and to see 12 baskets left over. That's what we ask. And I pray the same for each person in this room, Lord. May they find you the God, Jehovah Jireh, who will care for them, provide for them. Lord, we ask it in your name. Hear our song, Jesus. Hear our song as we worship you. Amen.